Hello, this is Mr. Smith for today's daily participation. You can click on resubmit and type three significant items in the text block. So why is poverty difficult to address? And we talked before about what poverty is exactly and what the poverty threshold and poverty rate are and the amount of people that fall beneath it and some of the government programs that are instituted. So the question is, how come we haven't completely gotten rid of it at this point? It did get reduced considerably during the 1920s, the booming, roaring 20s. Poverty was 40%. It was well above 30% during the booming 50s and the early 60s. And it wasn't until the Great Society programs were introduced that it was eventually brought down below 20%. that usually ranges between 10 and 15. So the question is, why can't we get it to drop even further? And, of course, one of the other issues involved with it is that we do end up spending more every year on anti-poverty programs. And so how do we get that to go away? Because obviously it's not just enough to make it look like it's gone away, but for from poverty to actually not exist anymore, so we're not spending as much money on these programs. So here's some of the solutions and difficulties that go along with it. One of them is welfare to work, and we talked about how Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, is a cash assistance program. Block grants are given out to states, and they decide how to distribute the cash with a few requirements. People have to work for two year, for two uh, within two years of them receiving the assistance. And there's a minimum amount of hours, over 30 hours for single people. And then for two head of household, it's more than that. So was that successful? And there's a lot of evidence to support that a lot more people did end up working than before this program was instituted. So welfare to work as part of TANF was pretty successful for the most part. Some of the areas where it wasn't is some argue that it forced especially single parents, like single mothers in particular, to go back to work, often causing them child care, which then basically takes away all the money that they would have earned anyway. There's also a problem when it comes to lack of jobs. There are people that are poor, so they don't have enough money to move to a different location. And in the geographic area that they're currently located, there aren't enough jobs to match their exact skills. And so they're faced with structural unemployment. And so there are difficulties, obviously, in getting everyone back to work and in jobs that they will be most effective. However, because of the drop in the number of people that are in poverty and the number, an increase in the number of people that are working, it has been argued that there should be some experimentation in linking other programs like SNAPs or food stamps, as it's known, to the work requirements as well. Although they weren't, but because some of these side effects, it should be done on a smaller scale and experimented with beforehand. Family structure. And this one is difficult for a variety of reasons, and probably one of the biggest is, should the government be involved in establishing some type of family structure? And many people believe it's unethical, especially if it's based on religious reasoning. But mathematically speaking, two incomes or two people is always better than one. Even if one isn't working, they can stay at home and take care of the household and the children where the other person could go out and earn an income. And so that addresses some of the problems that I just mentioned in welfare to work. But how does the government reasonably, reasonably get people to get, do that? And they can't bribe people. I mean, they could get them tax deductions for being married. But then are you occurring, or just basically encouraging one of two things, people that live together that don't like each other, or two, people to commit fraud because they'll claim that they're married but then have nothing to do with each other otherwise. And so that's a problem with the government trying to get involved in family structure. Uh, one of the things they could do is to make sure that, as we're talking about families here, we're also including children. So this isn't just single, you know, whether people are single or married and have no children. We're talking about the situation when children are involved. So one thing the government could do is take steps to be involved in making sure that unplanned pregnancies don't occur by offering better education in school and by offering better at health access to make sure that people can take preventative measures from having children in the first place. But that's also controversial because it costs money and involves people's personal choices. And of course, there is some disagreement about how the government should be involved in educating people on those types of choices in the first place because some deem it to be inappropriate to take place in schools. Then there's immigration. There are two ways to look at immigration. One is for people to come here that have a connection already. So somebody's uh, siblings, children, grandparents, or what have you, 
for instance, President Trump's wife is an immigrant, and her parents were eventually allowed to immigrate as well. So some people say immigration should be based on that, because that builds stronger families and communities when you have people that know each other and are related. On the other hand, though, some people argue that no, only immigrants should be allowed to come here that have certain skills that are able to fill certain types of jobs. And so that is a difficult situation to, to occur. Maybe it should be a little bit of a mixture of both. But obviously there are people that support either side of that. And the government, of course, also establishing which jobs matter and which labor is needed can also be difficult, especially if there's a lag effect. I mean, if there's an obvious shortage in nursing, for instance, and they allow a certain amount of people to immigrate that can qualify as nurses here in the United States, that's fine. But the gathering of statistics and the reporting of data there might be a one or two month gap. So by the time that we go through the process of getting immigrants to come here, maybe the nursing numbers have gone back up. And so it may have been unnecessary in the first place. So there, there are some inefficiencies in trying to fix labor problems with recruiting certain types of immigrants. So some people then on the other side argue, see, that's why we should just base it on relationships. And the last one is education. We concentrate a lot on college education in the United States, and that has led to an oversupply of people going into colleges in particular. And that is why, even though college wages typically on average are higher, they haven't gone up as much as they have in the past. And some, some college level jobs or jobs that are being offered to pay relatively little, sometimes less than $20 an hour. And so when that happens, of course, there needs to be a reconcentration on other fields, particularly education in the vocational areas, trade skills, plumbing, electrical work, carpentry, and so on, welding. And the problem is, of course, is that a lot of that goes on through apprenticeships and not through an actual institutional schooling. So how do they fund and encourage that if that's the case? Do they subsidize and help encourage people to go to trade schools more often? Or do they find some way to reward people that are involved in apprenticeships on their own? But then that comes back to the frog question. How do you know they're actually being truthful about it and so on? Are they, are they require, going to require documentation? But that requires government workers, bureaucrats, and office buildings and all kinds of resources to go through all that paperwork, which is going to make it more costly. And then the part that isn't talked about with education is uh, pre-primary, which involves, for instance, kindergarten for four- and five-year-olds. There's an enormous amount of evidence to show that when preschools are established within existing school systems in particular, that helps create a longer life a type of educational situation where people can improve and build on skills and provides a better motivation within families. When it's a program that's separate, it works too, but there has to be some kind of follow through. You can't just put a lot of emphasis on kids that are four and five and then dump them in a school system and not pay attention to them anymore. There has to be some kind of connection that's streamlined that goes through the entire system. But once again, obviously, for some people, it's controversial sending their kids to school at four and five. There are a lot of people that don't want to even send their kids to kindergarten. When I say a lot, it's, it's not a majority. It's, it's a small minority, but it's a sizable enough chunk that it's noticeable. And then on top of that, that obviously does require tax dollars as well. So these are some of the reasons why poverty is difficult to address. There's some moral and ethical issues, there's tax issues, and there's some issues about whether or not these programs are effective enough in the first place.